as it's been mentioned uh, many, many times already, this is Pastor Appreciation Sunday. And what we appreciate first and foremost is that 52 years ago, a young army man accepted an invitation to go to a place in South Tampa and was challenged for the very first time to consider the claims of Jesus Christ. In 1962, our pastor, my friend, accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into his life and began a journey. And at which time, 11 years later, 41 years ago, he heard the Lord speak to him and say, you're going to serve me and I'm going to use you to reach all over the world. And just in case nobody knows this, some of you might, but all of these flags that you see, the big flags around there, I know sometimes people come and they say, well, you don't have my country's flag up there. Well, that's because we haven't been to your country yet. <laughs> but all of these flags along the side are countries that this ministry has gone to right. and has created a work, whether it's a school, whether it's a church, whether it's a and in some cases, a school in the Dominican Republic for the deaf, ministry all over the world where these flags demonstrate the countries that this ministry has been to. And when you accepted that call in 1973 to serve him, it was through that obedience that God then gave you a vision along the Tarpon Springs Road and said, I want you to build a church. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. And we're sitting in it right now. Yeah. And not only because your obedience, but because the Lord also brought a lovely young lady into your life on a trip to Key West. But he didn't take you to Key West so that you would stay in Key West. He just took you there so that you could meet that young lady. And then the two of you would accept the call. And in 1983, begin this work known as Faith Outreach Center. And on this Sunday, October the 19th, 2014, the congregation of Faith, of Faith Outreach Center want to present to you, Pastor George Walters, and to your lovely spouse, Sister Mickey, this very special gift for, you, for the two of you to use and to enjoy, not only for yourselves, but for each other. And thank you for giving to the Lord. And at this time, I would ask uh, Gabrielle Scott as the singles director and Mrs. Sierra as the principal of Faith Outreach Academy to come and make presentations. Pastor George and Sister Mickey, I'm not going to clap. I want to say thank you on behalf of your singles ministry that you have entrusted to me and that you entrust every one of us here. And we just want you to know how much you are such a part of our lives, changes, and we just love you. I just want you to know that. We all want you to know that. Good morning, Pastor. I represent the school, and the students love you so much. These cards that they did for you are just a representation of their love. They appreciate everything that, that you have done here at the, the church and how much you reach out to them at the school. I know they love it when you come over and you, you bring the, the bucket band and you play your guitar. They <laughs> love it. So... 
on behalf of the students at the school, the students say, you are number one, you're great, and you rock. So <laughs> here you go. And uh, at this time, I want to uh, turn over the presentations to another young man that's a part of this ministry that appreciates the work that you're doing and what you entrusted to him. And I'm going to ask Mr. Howard to come now. Mr. Howard, I'm sure glad you dressed for the occasion. <laughs> Hello? Oh, there we are. Um, I'm Mr. Howard. Hello. <laughs> um, I also represent the, the school, um, with the, the high school and middle school, as well as the, the youth group. And they decided to put a video presentation together to express what you mean to them. So whenever you guys are ready. Thank you for being the Christ-like leader we need in our lives. You've helped mold us with your obedience, your love, your willingness to be led by the Holy Spirit, and most importantly, you have established hope and planted seeds that will grow as we grow. And once again, we thank you. Not just today, but every day. And we appreciate you. We love 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 you. You are. This time the uh, junior church can be dismissed. Junior church may be dismissed. Oh, Pastor, uh, I think your guest speaker is me. <laughs> uh, he's been talking about me ministering during the 1045 service for a while and I've <laughs> kind of ran from it but what better way to show my love and appreciation than with an act of obedience I love you sir you as well sister Vicky <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Bless you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for another opportunity to be able to share your goodness with the world. We thank you for the call that you placed on Pastor and Sister Mickey's life. We ask you, Lord God, that they realize not just today but every day how much each and every one of us love and appreciate them because they love and appreciate you. We pray, Lord God, that you would just touch me right now. Remove any nervousness, any anxiety, and just 
Move Samuel completely out of the way. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Allow your word and your truth to come rumbling forth and allow your people to receive what you would have to say to them. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, um, I spoke about Romans chapter 12, um, about making your life a living sacrifice, which is holy and acceptable to God, which is only your reasonable service. And last week, Dr. Seymour brought out a point that when, when Paul tells us not to be conformed to the world, what he was telling us was not to look like the world. Yes, we're all flesh and bones, and on the outside, we all look the same. You really can't tell who's a Christian and who's not. But by our actions and by our words, we should distinguish ourselves from the people of the world. And when he was talking to me about that beforehand, to me, he, he described Pastor George and Sister Mickey perfectly because you both are, are two individuals who, no matter what, you distinguish yourself from the world. And that's something that we can greatly appreciate, not just today, but, but every day. And before I go on, I just really want to say thank you both for, for being that Christ-like example to each and every one of us. Um, we all need that. We need that love and that admonishment at times because that's what Christ gives to us. Um, in John chapter 13, John chapter 13, starting at verse 13, It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. The point that really stuck out to me here was Jesus, the Lord and master of all, made himself to be a servant of all. And earlier in this passage, Christ is on his hands and knees washing the feet of his disciples. The people who thought they came to serve him, he in turn was serving them in the most humblest way to wash their feet. How many of us go around just washing each other's feet just on a whim? Hey, I love you. Let me shine your toes a little bit. We don't do that. But Christ did. Even the disciples, they were, they were perplexed by that. They were like, what are you doing? You... You should be high and lifted up. And Jesus said, no, I need to be here. Because if you ever want to be the greatest, you have to learn to be a servant. Pastor and Sister Mickey have, you know, told me over the years of their time before God called them to this place, how they served as youth pastors, how pastors served as praise and worship leader, how he did anything his pastor asked him to do. He learned to be a servant before God called him to lead this place. And Jesus says in um, verse 16 and 17, I say your servant is not greater than his master. Pastor never walks around telling everyone, I'm better than you. He calls everyone his buddy, his friend. He gives everyone a hug. He's not, you know, one of those pastors that, you can't reach him. He's always around. Amen. And Jesus said here, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's one thing to know you have to be a servant, but there's another thing to be a servant. 
and these people are servants, and they are blessed. And that's what the Word of God says. You will be blessed if you know to be a servant and you be a servant to others. Also, we can switch over to Matthew chapter 18. Starting at verse 1. It reads, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them and said, or surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. How much more can you do to receive little children than to open a school that proclaims the name of Jesus Christ? They are following an amazing Christ-like example. Every time Pastor or Sister Mickey goes into the school, all of the Little people. <laughs> I try to think of another word, but they're little people to me. All of the little people see them. They, they, they love them both. And most importantly, they respect them both because they show respect to them. And, you know, it, it's so funny. A couple of weeks ago, we were in a staff meeting, and Miss Carol mentioned to Pastor, you have a, a meeting over at 9.30 in the elementary building with all of the uh, little people. She didn't say little people, but <laughs> with, with the little people to, you know, with the bucket man. And whether or not he knew about it beforehand, it didn't matter. What he said was, I'm not going to disappoint those little people. Well, he didn't say little people, but... <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> he said, I'm not going to disappoint them. And that's the type of pastor we have. He could have easily said, well, I didn't know about this three weeks in advance. I have some other pastor-like thing to do. He said, get my guitar, get the bucket band. We're going to go over there, and we're going to show love to the little people. That's the pastor we serve. He's the same to the smallest all the way up to the elders and deacons. There's no favor. There's no partiality with them. He loves all of God's people. That's why we appreciate you so much. I guarantee you, if we polled people who you know, have been here, each and every one of them probably thinks you treat them the most special of all, not realizing that you spread that love to everyone. Um, one day I was talking to you know, Miss Tammy Gabos, and she was saying how so many people talk about, you know, how much you do for them. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought that was only me. <laughs> but the love that you have is, is such a realness. And that's exactly following a Christ-like example. Being real to each and every one of us. Doing to the least of us. You know, what other pastor do you know will help someone move into their apartment? My pastor did that for me. I remember when I was moving, my mom was like, Pastor shouldn't be licking this stuff and go get it from him. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, no, I got it. Just go get something else. <laughs> That's the pastor that God has placed in this place. He could have easily called um, you know, the deacons to do it, but he did it. How many times has air conditioners gone out or trees fallen unexpectedly? And pastor has been there. Praise God, you didn't get hurt, Brother Jack. <laughs> we know that our pastor is called by God. He was given a vision over 30 years ago to start a church, college, and academy that would touch the world. Faith Outreach Center and its ministries, it really does touch Judea, Samaria, and all the other most parts of the world. Why? 
because we have a pastor who is Christ-like. Jesus, Jesus is humble. He was born in a manger. He lived amongst the people. In the height of his popularity, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and its colt. That's humble. We have a pastor who is humble. He lives in our neighborhood. He actually drives the same model vehicle that I drive. <laughs> that, that humbleness is unmatched with anyone else that I know. I, I remember talking to him a few years ago about, we're just talking, you know, he, and I said, it's so cool how you, you know, open your house up to us and how you allow us to be in every aspect of your life. And you don't live, you know, out in some gay community and all this stuff. And he, he told me, he said, if my sheep don't live there, why should I live there? And, and that's the heart of our pastor. <laughs> he literally lives in walking distance from me. And there's a respect for someone who with all the lies that he's touched, all the, the people who know him, he's still a t-shirt and jeans kind of, kind of guy. <laughs> Jesus said that if you want to be the first, you must be a servant of all. If you, nev if you ever need anything, prayer, guidance, support, Pastor and Sister Mickey have been there. Talk about a servant of all. His motto is, just make it happen. And, and that's what he really lives by. He just make it happen. One day, something needed to be done over in the, the gym building, and he was in a white suit. And someone said, whatever needed to be done. So he went over there, and someone said, Pastor, you have on a white suit. He stopped, looked, and he said, I don't care. Something has to be done. And, you know, that, that's just awesome. This morning, we're walking around. Pastor goes over in the wet grass, picking up grass and moving things around. Getting done on him, or maybe again, I don't know. But he was in a suit. He didn't care. Something needed to be done, and he did it. Servant of all, humble, Christ-like. That's who our pastor is. In John chapter 15, looking at verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of the world calls each and every one of us his friend. He says, you're his friend if you will obey his commands. If you do what I've told you to do. First and foremost, to be a friend of Jesus Christ, you have to make him Lord of your life. You have to acknowledge verbally and in your heart that he's Lord and Master, that aside from him, we are nothing. Dr. Seymour already mentioned it over 50 years ago. They both acknowledged Jesus Christ as Lord and Master. He's called them friend. They were faithful with the things that God gave them, and he blessed them with more. Once we have made that decision 
to make Jesus Christ Lord of our life. And then we start serving him in whatever manner, whether it's as an usher on the praise and worship team, a Sunday school teacher, whatever God has called you to do, do it with your whole heart. If you want to show appreciation to our pastor and first lady, serve God. That's the best way to show them that you appreciate them. You want Jesus to call you his friend? Do as he commands. I mentioned at the start of this, you know, pastor has wanted me to speak during the morning service for a while. And I finally became obedient. That's what a lot of us do. We, we, we wrestle with things. I thought, I can't do it. There's too many people. What would they say? Um, I'm nervous. I, no, 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 thank you. Uh, I laughed it off. But we have to be obedient to whatever call God has on our life. We wonder why some of our prayers aren't getting answered. Maybe we're not answering or doing what God has told us to do. How can we be one-sided Christians? God, you do everything I want you to do, and I'll do nothing that you want me to do. That's not how we treat our friends. We treat our friends. You're there for me. I'm there for you. I have your back till the end. Jesus showed his ultimate love for us that before we were even his friend, before we even acknowledged him, while we were still out in the midst of our sin, he died for us. How many friends that you know of will give their, ver give their very last for you, knowing that you probably wouldn't even appreciate it? My friend Jesus, he did that for me, and he did that for you. I appreciate that says that no greater love for a friend than to lay down his life. Amen. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our life for him. Amen. We ought to do what he has called us to do. No questions asked. He didn't question whether or not you were worth it. He stretched his hands and he died. And he said, I love you this much that I would die for you. In Luke chapter 2, we're not going to go there, but in Luke chapter 2, verse 39 to 52, it's a story of Jesus as a young boy when he and his family went up to Jerusalem for Passover and the time had come for them to leave. Jesus, unbeknownst to his parents, stayed behind and the Bible says that he was preaching and teaching in the synagogue. And when his family, when his parents finally found him and said, Jesus, what are you doing? I truly believe, I know because the Bible says it, that the very thing that Jesus told his parents is a thing that Pastor and Sister Mickey say to each other every day. Getting you know I have to be about my father's business. Their passion and their drive is because they know that this is their father's business. And they love their father so much. And that love is expressed with all of us. No one else could have gotten me up here <laughs> besides Jesus Christ and Sister Mickey and Pastor. <laughs> I received that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. But we need to be about our Father's business. We need to be doing whatever it takes to let the world know that Jesus is still on the throne and that he desires for each and every person to be his friend, to be connected with him eternally. But are we being Christ-like 
is our walk lining up with our talk. We can quote scripture. We can say all the Christianese that we want. But when the rubber hits the road, is your life a living testimony of whose you are? When someone cuts you off, someone curses you out, someone does something you don't like, is Christ showing through or is it you that they're seeing? That is what the devil, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your testimony. He wants to kill your joy. He wants to destroy your chance of serving the Lord. We cannot allow it. We have to stand for Christ as he stood for us. Jesus gave his all for us. How are we showing that appreciation to Christ? In John chapter 10. Verse 7 to 12. It says, When Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flee. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. And here in this passage, Jesus is literally saying, as he being the door, he is laying at the door so that whenever the enemy tries to come for his sheep, he is there. He is the ultimate protector. It says here that when the sheep hear other voices, they're not even bothered by it because they know their shepherd. Jesus is that ultimate good shepherd. Our pastor is modeling that. He is a Christ-like shepherd. If there's so many times that he said, I haven't seen so-and-so, where is this person? He notices of a crowd this size, and this isn't even a packed house. He notices when we're not here because God has put it in his heart to pay attention, to know the heartbeat of his sheep. I, I guarantee if anyone ever tried to come against his sheep, he'd be the first one there defending his sheep. Because he's following a Christ-like example. That type of appreciation, or excuse me, that type of a habit, thing, and I lost my word. Anywho, the love that he shows in doing that, in that obedience, is unmatched. So I, I, I challenge each and every one of us, more than just today, more than just the month of October. Let's express our appreciation to our pastor and to his wife. How many nights has she laid in bed alone because he's been out tending to a sheep? How many nights has he laid in bed when she's been out attending to a sheep? We don't know. I guarantee you it's countless hours. Let's show our appreciation with obedience, with doing the will of God, and actually telling them, 
We appreciate you. We love you. Thank you. It's more than just one month a year. Watch how you're blessed for blessing them. I tell you, this past almost year and a half of me serving as a youth pastor has been filled with so many blessings. Each time I'm called to speak, I almost get sick to my stomach, but I have to die to that because I know first and foremost that Christ died for me. And secondly, I know they would do anything for me, and I know that they're hearing from God. And if they've asked me to do something, then I know it's something, number one, for my best interest. And they're following what God has called them to do. So, in closing, I love you. We all love you. We appreciate you. Pastor George. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated for a moment. A couple of interesting things that Mr. Howard said this morning. It was interesting that Brother Tian and I were in my office prior to the service and talking about that sacrifice, Mr. Howard, that sa I beseech you therefore, brother, in Romans 12, 1, by the mercies of God, to make your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Brother Tian mentioned that there's one Old Testament example that really brings out what that means. I'm going to give it to you. Abraham and Isaac. Abraham now is told to take his son to the mountain because there was going to be a sacrifice. In fact, he told Abraham he's going to sacrifice his son. He made preparation. He loaded his donkey with the wood. He had all that was going to take to build the altar and to put the fire on the altar. And Isaac was going to be the sacrifice. Now they're on their way, traveling to the top of the mountain, just a father and son. Remember, it's the son that was the promise. Amen? The son that God promised that this was going to be the son that's going to bring forth a nation of people that's going to be like the stars in the sky and the sand and the sea. And now this son is going to be sacrificed. On the way to the mountain, Isaac says, Dad, we got the fire. We got the wood for the fire. We got all that we need. Where's the sacrifice? How many of you know for a son to ask his dad that when his dad's planning on using the son as a sacrifice? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to make your bodies a kind of sacrifice that you trust God to the ultimate. Is anybody with me? So Abraham says to Isaac, son, God will provide the sacrifice. God already told him that it was going to be Isaac, but he said God's going to provide a sacrifice because there was a trust in God that was beyond the natural. Abraham trusted God beyond what he could see and feel and touch at the moment. Isaac said, but dad, where's the sacrifice? He said, God will provide a sacrifice. I believe something settled in Isaac's heart right then to say, I don't understand this, but I trust the faith my dad has in the God that he trusts. Is anybody with me? I trust my dad so much because he's proven himself to be one that trusts God in the time of trouble, in the time of un un 
not knowing what's going on, in the time of insecurity, in the time when we don't have the answers, he has seen Abraham trust God, his father. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. We're in the New Testament now, amen. We got the example. How many of you know the Old Testament is a type and shadow? It's an example to teach us how to operate in the principles of the kingdom. How many of you believe that with me? We can walk through the word of God and we can find all the different places where it's a type and shadow. Amen. Now they get to the mountain. The altar's built. The sacrifice is put on the altar. Tian said this real neat this morning. He said, you know, I don't think Isaac struggled. I don't think he kept wiggling on that altar saying, let me out of here before the fire lights. How many of you believe he trusted his father enough that if the father put him on the altar of sacrifice, he trusted God, he trusted his father enough that trusted the God that he served, that if you're going to put me on the altar, I don't know what's going to happen, but God's going to see me through. It's like the three Hebrew children. King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to bow. You need to bow to my idols, we're not going to bow. And they said this. They said, our God will deliver us. But there's an addendum to that. Our God's going to deliver us, but if he don't. But if he don't, that doesn't change my mind. But if he don't, I'm not backing down. But if he don't, I'm not bowing. Okay. But if he don't, I still won't bow. Anybody with me on that? Here's Isaac on the altar of sacrifice. The next thing is to light the fire and let him be consumed. Abraham picks up the knife. He's going to kill his son first before he burns him. By the time he brings the knife down, an on-time God spoke loud. May not be there when you want him. But he'll be there right on time. Because he's an on-time God. Yes, he is. The knife starts to come down and God says, Abraham, stop. The sacrifice is in the thicket. Look in the bush. There'll be a ram there. I still want you to sacrifice before me. I still want you to. I still want you to make a sacrifice on the altar that you built for to honor me with. But Isaac's the promise. He's the one that's going to bring forth the next generation. Isaac didn't struggle. He didn't fight. He didn't give his dad a hard time. He didn't say, I don't think this is going to work. He trusted his father because he knew his father trusted the God that he served. Does anybody follow me on this? You see, that's what trust is all about. And then Mr. Howard went to John 15. I want us to look at that for a second, and I'm going to be done. Mr. Howard, what a beautiful word you brought. Stirred me. You stirred me this morning. He read in John 15 and verse 15. Verse 16 says, you didn't choose me. Jesus said, you didn't choose me. You're not in this because of you. You didn't choose what you're going to do. You didn't choose to serve me. He said, but you didn't choose me, but I chose you. Everybody ought to rejoice over that. God loves you so much he chose you. You didn't choose me. In other words, in case anybody says, praise God, I found Jesus. No, you didn't find Jesus. He wasn't lost. <laughs> I said, Jesus wasn't lost. You didn't find him. He found you. He found me. I was lost. See, if I found him, that means that I was okay, but he was lost. Isn't that right? But if he found me, then I was lost and he was okay. Is anybody tracking me this morning? 
You didn't choose me, but I chose you. Not only did I choose you. And I remember, sweetheart, 1973, when I surrendered to the call of ministry. And we made a commitment. We're going to serve the Lord. That's for me and my house. That's for you and me. We can't speak for anybody else, but for us. We made a surrender that no matter what God wanted, we was going to serve him. Amen. Has it, has it all been easy? Has it been an easy road? Has everything been like floating around the cloud waiting for Jesus to come, going, uh, singing uh, how, how good it is? I mean, you know, for the last 40 years of ministry, there's been plenty of ups and downs and opportunities to quit, opportunities to give up. I tell people all the time, quit all you want, just don't follow through. Amen. You can quit. Go ahead. Want to quit? Quit. Want to quit on God? Go ahead and quit. Just don't follow through. Isn't that right? You didn't choose me, but I chose you. And here, here it is, sweetheart. And I appointed. I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. See, God appointed me. Not only to preach the gospel. Not only to live a life before people that will be, a, that, that I can say follow me as I follow Christ. Amen. Don't follow me if I'm not following Christ. Paul said follow me as I follow Christ. But we've been appointed. We've been called. We've been chosen. Just like you. How many of you know you've been appointed? Every child of God has been appointed. God chose you and he appointed you to do some great things for him. To do what? To bear fruit. Everything, we, ought to, everything we, we do should bear fruit. It ought to make a difference in somebody else's life. It ought to touch somebody. Whenever you leave the presence of somebody, something ought to have taken place in their life that, that, that they was raised up just a little bit because of the presence of God and the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Amen? You didn't choose... Me, Jesus said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit, listen, and that your fruit should remain. Don't just bear a little fruit and let it go to the ground and spoil it and don't bear any more fruit, but the fruit should remain. That whatever you ask, I believe, I believe if we bear fruit, if we know we're chosen by God, if we know we're appointed, called, and commissioned, then here's what's going to happen. Whatever you ask, in my name, I'll give it to you. He said, whatever you ask in my name, I'll give it to you. These things I've commanded you that you love one another. See, we've got to love one another. That's part of it. Part of it. We've got to walk in unforgiveness. We've got to walk free of any kind of hurts, wounds, and burdens. No matter what somebody does to us we got to say, Lord, I give it to you. This isn't mine. This is yours. And you'll be free. Because whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. Somebody give the Lord a big praise for this this morning. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate so much all the kindness and all the sweet things that's been done and said this morning Mr. Howard said a very important thing if you really want to make this pastor happy and proud serve God with all your heart bear fruit live your life in abundance don't let one day be spoiled by some goofy thing that somebody else did or what somebody else said get caught up in their attitude rise above it because the God we serve he's bigger than ever, anything that can happen he's bigger amen hallelujah thank you Lord thank you Lord what are you going to play what are you going to say he is my everything go ahead do it how many of you believe he's everything in your life 
Here's a question for you while the instruments are getting ready. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus as your own personal Savior. If you're here and you don't know for sure that you got a home in heaven, if you would die tonight, you know that you're going to heaven. Your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Could, could this pastor have the privilege and the honor to pray with you? Make sure, make sure that you're ready for heaven. If for some reason you've come in this morning and you used to serve the Lord, you used to be excited about God, but somebody hurt you, somebody wounded you, disappointed you, maybe even a pastor, a church member, or a leader. Why let that stand in the way? Why let that hold you back? I hear the voice of the Lord calling some folks saying, it's time to come home. It's time to come home. Because I love you and I'm a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I've chosen you to bear fruit. Amen. If you meet either one of those categories, you're a person that needs to make a decision to let Jesus into your heart or you need to recommit your life afresh to the Lord. Why not today? Why not right now? By the uplifted hand, when you say, Pastor, pray for me. Is there someone here that needs to surrender your life to the Lord afresh? Is there anybody here? Is there one? We can pray with you. Is there one? Say, that's me, Pastor. Take your hands up. God bless you, sweetheart. Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else? Say, me too. God bless you. Somebody else? Say, me too. God bless you. Somebody else? Say, Pastor, just... I want to make a fresh commitment to the Lord. There's been some things that hadn't been right with me, but I, I know God loves me. He forgives me. And I'm coming home today. If that's you, raise your hand. Stand with me, if you will, everybody, please. My everything, both great and small. When my leaders come to the altar, my life for me. Well, he made everything new. He is my everything. Well, how about you? There was a couple of folks that raised their hand. Would you step by that aisle right now? Meet me over here in this corner and let's pray with you. You want to make a fresh decision to let Jesus be Lord of your life? Will you come? Don't let what somebody might say or somebody wounded you along the way. Don't let that stand in the way. Come. Meet me right here. Now if you have a need, you need prayer. You need a healing in your body. You need God to touch you in any way at all. Just come. Somebody's here to pray with you. Scripture says where two or three shall agree, touching any one thing, it shall be done. Would you come?
changed your life? Has he made everything new? we're closing this service I want to invite you to come back tonight at 6 o'clock Thursday night I ministered on the theme what is acceptable worship acceptable how many of I mean, you know if Jesus said to the woman of the well God seeks after worshipers that will worship in spirit and truth then there must be some people that are worshiping not in the spirit and not in truth. How many of you believe that? And many churches, many Christians think they're worshiping God in truth. And many times it's not acceptable worship. David did that when he brought the ark back, remember? Until he learned how to handle the ark by the Levites instead of on an ox cart, it was unacceptable worship. Cain, Cain killed his brother Abel because Cain brought unacceptable unacceptable worship to the Lord and God didn't receive what he brought so we're going to minister on that tonight come tonight and let's learn let's really learn what is acceptable worship to God because when we worship in spirit and in truth acceptable worship it opens up a whole new avenue for God's power to operate in our life come back tonight at 6 o'clock what is acceptable worship he is my everything. Oh, well, how about you? Play it, Annie. I appreciate Bobby Patton, my co-worker, my son in the faith, my brother in the Lord, brother Nick, one of our staff members being here that this morning. Thank you, Pastor Bobby. Thank you, Nick. The rest of you that are here, I appreciate it, Mickey, and I appreciate it so much. Let the Lord finish having his way this morning before you leave, unless you absolutely got to go to work or something. We understand that. This is God's time to hover and brood, touch a life. It's really not a time to be leaving until God's done. He is my everything. He is my all. Sing it with me, church. He is my every good and successful man there's an awesome woman that supports him and loves him and encourages him sees him through his weak moments and his depressions and listens to him moan and groan when nobody else does but this first lady right here Faith Outreach Center is second to none She's my bride. She's my wife. She's my lover. She's the love of my life. And she does so much here, church. Listen. She does so much that many of you don't have a clue what she does to keep things going. Everything from watching over the finances and watches every penny to administrating the school and making sure that everything's done in an order. And most of all, 
watches over me. That's a big job. <laughs> she says, I don't have but one angel watching over me. I got three or four of them. And I wear them out at the end of the day, she said. But this is a special lady, and I appreciate your love for both of us. And I just want to say we love you with all of our heart. My goodness gracious. You know, you couldn't do what you do around here if you didn't have the wonderful staff that we have. And we have the best staff in the world. We really do. Um, everyone here has, is, is part of the family. We call it the family. Anne is part of the family. And, you know, you can have great vision, but if you don't have implementers, you just have a thought. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. But, you know, I thank God every day for the staff that we do have here. And I thank you as a congregation for just loving us, receiving us, and all the wonderful things that were said today. But the most important thing is what Pastor said. Keep on keeping on and find that purpose. Find the purpose. I'm going to minister one day on that, finding the purpose. Because when we find our purpose and we begin to move in that purpose, we move in God's divine order. And when we find it, it's going to be the greatest thing that ever happened in your life. I'm telling you what. Simeon, you're moving in God's purpose. All right. Let's pray. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I'll see you back tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, for the mighty word that was brought forth this morning, Lord God. We thank you for everything that took place. Now, Lord, just give us a good, restful afternoon with a wonderful dinner. Bring us back tonight with joy in our heart and expectation, Father, of what you're going to do and speak into our life tonight. Now, Father, we'll give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. See y'all later.